Hey there, everyone. How you doing today? So I have a video or a presentation that I've been thinking about for probably a month now. And that is really taking the real estate investing environment uh, that I've been executing the last 20 years. And what does it possibly look like post event? So I'm calling this presentation Real Estate Investing 2.0. I'm going to take great care to kind of lay out the chessboard how I see it. I'm going to talk about each little different piece <clears throat> and I want your feedback. I want you to tell me what pieces I have wrong. Uh, I want to tell you what, tell me what pieces I'm missing uh, because as we look at the real estate investing landscape or what I'm calling real estate investing 2.0, I am very, very excited. I see a lot of opportunity ahead of us. Uh, you know, that opportunity comes from chaos and pain. So I'm not confused about that. We have a long road to go, but you know, we're going to get through this. So what does that other side look at? So uh, do me a favor again, watch this. Let me know what you think. Tell me what I'm missing. Tell me what I got wrong and uh, let's play it out. <coughs> All right. So I'm calling this real estate investing 2.0 really on the concept of post this event. So late, you know, middle of 2020 through all of 2021. That's kind of my time horizon for this post 2021. My crystal ball doesn't go that far. <clears throat> I'm really worried about what I can do now versus later. So let me know what you think. So again, it's, it's about looking at the chessboard. Excuse me, <coughs> man, I take a drink of water. In reality, this is coffee, not water. It's still early for me. So what does the chessboard look like? Where are the pieces? How do the pieces look? How can I understand them? Uh, and then how might they move? So first off, this is a big one. <coughs> Man, scratchy throat. So first off, forbearance. This is a very common topic. Uh, last I saw, we might have 4 million on our way to 20 million people asking for forbearance. <clears throat> Lots of these are in the owner occupant market. I unfortunately think, or I unfortunately believe that forbearance is not the cure all most people think it is. Uh, I think it will certainly help some. Uh, I just don't think it will help most. <clears throat> I think there will be a downside to it. Uh, I actually did a video a couple of weeks ago called the dark side of forbearance. So check that out. But I think forbearance whether it's three, six, nine, 12 months, ultimately leads to foreclosures, short sales. In fairness, I think it may have prevented some, but it's gonna cause others. So that is one important piece to realize. <laughs> I think there's a bunch of investors or, or buyers that are gonna get to the end of the forbearance period and realize they don't have a better option. So that's, some, that's a chessboard piece that I see. Let me know what you think. I think it's clear lending is tightening up both in the multifamily space, but also in the residential space. I don't think that's over. If you look at these big banks, they've just had a couple of their earnings announcement. They're putting away billions of dollars for bad debt. A lot of that is credit card related, but it will very quickly become mortgage loans going bad. So I see lending getting tighter and I see it, I see it overreacting in 2020 and, the, and then loosening in 2021. That's important because if you've read our story, you've been following this channel, as lending tightens, prices go down, historically speaking, and then as lending loosens, prices go up, right? So uh, understanding that 2020 will likely be a tightening period and then 2021 be loosening, that's an important chess piece to understand. Let me know what you think. Unemployment. This is important because, you know, we came out of an environment that was three and a half percent kind of record level stuff. Uh, we are certainly going to get to an environment that's 25 percent, at least short term. But the question is, what are we on the other side? I think we're double what we were. I don't see this dramatic snapback V-shape 
we go right back to 3.5% unemployment. I think we're above 7% for the next six or seven quarters. And that's going to have an impact, right? So, you know, what does that mean? Less, less buyers, more concern, you know, I don't know. Let me know what you think. What do you, do you see unemployment being higher or lower than 7%, you know, as we start 2021? Let me know what you think. Bigger is not better. Uh, if you've been following this channel for any length of time, you know that that has been a constant mantra of mine for well over a year. Uh, it has now come to be. There are now plenty of multifamily syndications and new apartment investors who are realizing that they paid silly cap rates, took uh, unrealistic assumptions, and are now in trouble. I believe. You know, as we've said, I think I did an interview with Jonathan Twomley two weeks ago talking about multifamily pretty easily falling 30% in value, which affects refis and all of that stuff. I don't think there's going to be a lot of people fishing in the multifamily environment for two to three years because that's just how long it takes for their debt to come to a point of, you know, causing an event, a refi or, a, a, you know, some kind of selling event. So I think single family homes. You know, going into this, we're already a better investment. And I think single family homes are going to be even more appreciated because bigger isn't better. I think that renter nation continues. I think we see a continued drop in owner occupants. Uh, but we still need a roof over our head. We still need shelter. Uh, you know, I don't know what the latest statistics are, but I would suspect we have less owner occupants and more renters in the next two years. And again, that's important because then you could look at the chessboard and go, okay, where are those renters going? These are important pieces to understand. Builders, this is a new one for me and this just came today. I've, I've thought about it for several weeks, but when you saw the builders sentiment report that was, came out and they posted a 13 on um, buyer traffic and anything below 50, is a problem. So a 13 is like a real problem. Builders are going to get crushed. They came into this environment full steam ahead, full steam, right? They were adding lots, adding, you know, they couldn't get employees. They couldn't get people. Now demand is gone. Buyer traffic is gone. They have finished product coming available at perhaps the worst time. Uh, I did, a, again, a report on uh, with Michael Hernandez, a, a real estate agent in my market. And he was like, man, there's a lot of inventory coming on above 300 grand, which is above the median for my market. So we dug into a little bit, dug into that. And it is all these builders just throwing finished units on the market. And of course, builders just keep building and they, they run out of cash. They are going to be cash strapped. Not good. Builders are in some serious, serious pain. Here's one that I want to get your opinion on. And again, I say this as an owner of apartments and houses. I suspect coming out of this health event, more and more people are going to want to leave apartments and go to homes because it's a lot easier to shelter in place when you have your own backyard, front yard for that matter than it is in an apartment. So I think people are gonna partner up and go, hey, instead of you and I live in two, you know, you live in A, I live in B, let's go rent a house. I think there are gonna be more people looking to rent houses and they're not, and they're gonna double up. So it's, you know, you might be able to live in an apartment by yourself, but if you partner up with your best friend, you can rent a house. I think people are gonna to wanna to rent houses. Now this could just be a guy who's, very biased, who's been calling single family homes a better investment for 12 to 18 months. I admit that. But let me know why I'm wrong. I'd love to hear from you. Um, because I, 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 like, I like it when we can debate topics and have rational discussions. I'm sharing with you what I see on the chessboard. So you let me know it, where I'm wrong. I, I, it happens all the time. I think there's going to be less licensed real estate agents post this event. Um, this, 
I could I could bet on this one. Uh, you know, this is very much like 2006 to 2010. Uh, 2006 was the last peak in licensees. 2010 was the bottom. It's going to happen again. Uh, real estate agents are going to get washed out. They're going to do something else. Um, but again, that's going to that's going to create opportunities for others. Uh, but again, there's going to be less licensed agents. I think there's going to be more services available in real estate investing. And I'm trying to figure out what those are because again, I have this office building in real in Fresno called the hub and I want to stock it full of real estate services. Uh, the most obvious one is virtual tours. I might want to stash that. I might want to create a podcast room so agents can come in and talk about their products. You know, I, there's going to be some services. And again, I want to be thinking ahead. So let me know what real estate services are important and could be game changing because I might want to put those in my office in Fresno. Uh, Cause again, I, I want to be there for 50 years and I would love to hear what you think. Here's a big one. Um, and if you read our story, one rental at a time available on audible and Amazon, we built our entire portfolio except for two transactions out of the multiple listing service. Think Redfin, think realtor.com. And I think that is going to become the mark. I think that's where shopping is going to be. I think there's going to be on sale merchandise on sale listings in the MLS. I think foreclosures and short sales are in our future, probably the second half of 2020 and into 2021. I think that the, I think there'll be less mailers and stuff like that from wholesalers. I think wholesalers fall off a cliff uh, as far as quantity. It's not going to be as easy uh, going forward. So you need to learn your market. I keep telling you that's the magic in all of this. It's really the only thing I was any good at for the first 10 years was learning my market. And it's, it's time when the MLS has deals, get greedy. I do think creative buying will lead to more transactions the next two years. I don't think cash is going to be most transactions, right? So for example, if there was a new house that was bought in the last five years, you're not going to buy that for cash because there's really no equity and there's no value. But if you can take over a low mortgage somehow, some way, I think that's going to be pretty popular. So real estate agents, you need to figure out how to sell a house that has no equity, but has a good mortgage rate. You need to call me if you're in Fresno and Madera, because I want to buy hundreds of those if I can. Um, but we need to work together. So I do think having cash will be important, may get you some deals, but I think being creative is going to be the big driver. You know, this is, I, I'm going to keep repeating this probably for the next decade but you need to learn your market. You don't trust others. Don't believe others. You need to learn your market. This is the time when you're at home, spend 15 or 20 minutes a day looking at your market, tracking it, seeing what's going on. You are going to get a glimpse of your market in the next 90 days that is priceless. If you could learn your market in the next 90 days, you're gonna, it took me 10 years because my market was like this or like this for the first 10 years. It wasn't until it rolled over in 08, 09, 10 that I was like, oh my God, I get it. This next window of time, fantastic. Even if we go to 25% unemployment, that is still 75% or employed. You, you need to buy your first four rentals these next four years. Learn your market, learn your market, learn your market. And if you need any help with that, I took the time years ago and I'm so thankful I did. It's the best thing I've created. I documented the entire process I use and still use today to learn my market, track it, how I compare deals, how I can compare a house with an apartment building. Again, it's everything I've done. I've extended the value because I created a private Facebook group just for students. And now since we're all home, I'm doing weekly Facebook live sessions in my private Facebook group just for students. If you want to be mentored by me, you want to talk with me, you want to ask me questions, you got to buy the course. You got to join the private Facebook group and then be ready for Saturday. Saturdays is when we decided to do them. Uh, Saturdays are the live streams, usually at 8 or 9 a.m. Pacific. So 
that's what I see. That's real estate investing 2.0. Those are the chess pieces on the board. What did I get wrong? Debate with me. Let me know. Leave comments below. Also, please, please, please tell me what pieces I'm missing. Because I think there's some pieces I'm missing. I've been playing with this idea for a couple of weeks. It will probably evolve over the next several months, which I may do another one of these. But real estate investing 2.0 is going to be a thing. How are you going to take advantage of it? Are you going to learn your market? Are you going to let this opportunity pass you by? 2010 was the best year for me. And it's because I had invested all that time learning my market. You've been given a gift. You've been given time and you've been given a real opportunity to look at public data to learn your market. Please don't miss this opportunity. I hope you don't. All right, take care.